You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you would take your Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, uh, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 14, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and I uh, figured, you know, the title of the sermon, Morning is Better Than Feasting, I mean, that, that can't be a better message than right after Thanksgiving, right? I mean, that's, uh, well, well, you can judge after <laughs> we are, we're done here. Um, but again, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. In his book, Trusting God Even When Life Hurts, Jerry Bridges discusses how God uses adversity to cause us to grow in our Christian lives. And he begins that specific chapter uh, by talking about a story where someone is watching a moth emerge from its cocoon. And that individual watching the moth, watched the moth struggle, uh, decided that he would help the moth along. And so he clipped the cocoon, and then the moth emerged with its wings wrinkled and withered. And as the person watched the moth, he recognized that the moth's wings were weak. And so Jerry Bridges says this, he says, The moth, which in a few moments would have stretched those wings to fly, was now doomed to crawling out its brief life in frustration of ever being the beautiful creature God created it to be. What the person in this story did, not realizing that the struggle to emerge from the cocoon was an essential part of developing the muscle system of the moth's body and pushing the fluid, the body fluid out into the wings to expand them. By unwisely seeking to cut short the moth's struggle, the watcher had actually crippled the moth and doomed his existence. And using this story as an illustration, Jerry Bridges goes on to say this, The adversity of life are much like the cocoon of the Cyclopea moth. God uses them to develop the spiritual muscle system of our lives. We can be sure that the development of a beautiful Christ-like character will not occur in our lives without adversity. We may think we have true Christian love until someone offends us or treats us unjustly. Then we begin to see anger and resentment well up within us. We may conclude we have learned about genuine Christian joy until our lives are shattered by an unexpected calamity or grievous disappointment. Adversity spoils our peace and sorely tries patience. God uses those difficulties to reveal to us our need to grow so that we will reach out to him to change us more and more into the likeness of his son. And I think Jerry Bridges is right. Uh, absolutely right here. And as we will see this morning, I I believe at least in part through our passage here, uh, we'll see that mourning is is important for a Christian life, that suffering is important. We'll see that God causes growth through adversity, using adversity, as he says here in our text, to cause thoughtful self-reflection in our lives. Uh, that's what we're going to see. And so before we get into that, just one more quote from Jerry Bridges in that chapter. He says, Fortunately, God does not ask us how or when we want to grow. He is the master teacher, training his pupils when and how he deems best. He is, in the words of Jesus, the gardener who prunes the branches of his vineyard. The healthy vine requires both nourishment and pruning. Through the word of God, we are nourished. But through adversity, we are pruned. And so this is a, a thought that I think we should take into this passage as we, we think about what Solomon is saying here in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And so as we get into this passage, remember last week, uh, we discussed how, uh, we discussed about wealth and poverty, uh, really for the last two weeks. That was a section that covered chapter 5, verse 8 through chapter 10, or chapter 6. Sorry, we didn't get to chapter 10 yet. (laughs) But now as we come to chapter 7, and we see the first part in the first 14 verses, the preacher here in this section uh, comes at the reader 
with a different tactic. Uh, Here we see Solomon uh, comes at us with one proverb after another, just boom, 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 one pithy why saying after another. And what we see here, again, is the effects of suffering. We see actually both good effects and and bad effects, and, and we'll get into that. And so as we go through this, we see in verses 1 through 6, it is better to have pain and suffering that forces us into thoughtful reflection uh, rather than pursuing a good time that helps us avoid self-reflection. And then in verses 7 through 10, uh, we will see the harm that comes to the one who does not patiently endure under suffering. And in these first two sections, uh, we'll see Solomon make comparisons between two things. And he'll show us which of the two are better. And in doing so, in in these comparisons, he really flips our natural thinking upside down. And we'll see that as we go. And then in verses 11 through 12, we see that wisdom is more valuable than riches. And finally, verses 13 and 14 talk to us about God being sovereign over all of our circumstances, over everything that we face in this life. And so let's go through this passage here this morning. Let's read it together. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity." Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom perseveres the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful, and in the day of adversity, consider God has made them one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. So again, as we we look at this passage here this morning, we see in verses 1 through 6, it tells us again how it is better to have pain and suffering that, again, forces us into thoughtful reflection rather than pursuing a good time that can help us avoid self-reflection. And we see here in these first couple verses the idea of death and how we should focus on death the reality of it. Again, verse 1 says, a good name is better than precious ointments, and the day of death than the day of birth. Now, when it says a good name, it's referring to one's reputation that comes out of having a character of integrity. An ointment or oil is that which was expensive and highly sought after, used mainly to cover up body odor, or it could be in reference to that which was used to prepare a body for burial. But in any case, again, it was something that was expensive and highly sought after. But having a good reputation from a respectable character, having a good name, is better than having these oils, these highly desired and expensive gifts. So in the same way that a good name is better than precious ointment, so too the day of death is better than the day of birth. Why? Why would he say that? 
Well, the day of one's birth is a day that is usually accompanied with celebration, right? Excitement, congratulations, and the like. It is not usually a somber time or a time of reflection, as opposed to the day of one's death, where what made a person's life lived well or not lived well is reflected upon. And then, too, if we are thinking of the death of someone else, that often causes us to reflect on our own deaths and understand that as a reality. And I think that's why Solomon follows up here, verse 1, with verse 2 by saying, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. And the reason he gives for that is for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Now, this is a verse that I have often referenced at a funeral, saying to those in attendance to the funeral that though being here and being here for the reason that we are is not something any one of us would choose, yet nonetheless, it is good for us to be here. And I I would quote the verse and explain it. And it's true. It's better to be at a funeral than to be at a birthday party. Because the reality is every birth is followed by death. Death is the reality for all of us, and so we must lay it to heart. You might keep back and say, yes, but we all were born too. We all have birthdays. But again, a party does not cause much reflection as opposed to a funeral. I've heard, I forget who it was. I want to say it was Alistair Begg, or maybe it was Sinclair Ferguson, I can't remember. It's one of those Scotsmen. Um, but they talked about the popular notion of, of not having a funeral, but having a celebration of life. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong. Uh, we should celebrate people's lives who have lived and have God has used in our lives and, and have been great examples for us. But we, we have to have funerals, too. Uh, and they talk about that the idea of trying to avoid mourning and, and we just want to celebrate. And he said that a large part of that is because we don't have a, a theology of mourning. And we don't understand its place and, and God's use of it. And, and I, I think that's true and that's right. But I also wonder, too, if part of the reason we see that as such a popular notion is trying to avoid the whole idea of that somber reflection in our mourning. And the realization that Not only has this one lived, but they have died, and I'm going to die one day too. That's what the death of a loved one should bring us to. We should have those reflections. A funeral should should cause us to do that. But we'd rather very often avoid that thought. You know, a number of years ago, uh, there was a man I know, uh, and it was a couple months after his father had died, And something was not going his way, and he was quite frustrated. And so he threw up his arms and said, you know what, dad's dead, and I'm going to be dead one day soon anyway, so what does it matter? And either with wisdom or without wisdom, I think the verdict's still kind of out on that. But in that moment, I I said to him, well, yeah, you're right. You are going to die. And so what's going to happen to you when you die? Where will you be? And his answer was, I try not to think about it. And again, that was, that was some years ago. And it would seem that even to this day, he still does his best to try not to think about it. But really, that's to be a fool. That doesn't avoid the reality. That doesn't avoid the truth. That doesn't solve anything. But we should think about it. Uh, My friend, you are not promised your next breath. Uh, You're not promised anything. None of us are. Death is a reality for us. So we have to take it to heart and consider how we've lived. What should the holy God and just God do with you and the life that you have lived? You know, very often we try to smooth that over. But the idea of recognizing, well, I'm I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. And 
the first problem with that is that the standard is perfection. You're right, you're not perfect, but Jesus said in Matthew 7, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, The standard is the perfection of God, his very character as reflected in his law. But as we look at his law, we see it's, it's much worse than just not being perfect. We are wretched sinners. We are rebellion, rebel, those in rebellion against God in of ourselves. We see in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all fall short of that standard that is his very character. And because of that falling short, because of our sin, we face death. And not only do we die physically, but we die an eternal death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our only hope for the curse of death for the wrath that we have earned in our rebellion and our sin against God, is this free gift. Uh, Not something we can earn or, or make ourselves fit for, but what God has freely chosen to give of his own freedom to give to those who have faith in Jesus. So my friends, you must turn to Jesus to be saved. Turn to him by faith, trusting in him to deal with your sin and to empower you to turn away from your sin in repentance. All who believe on Jesus Christ will be saved. That's the answer to the the curse of death that is brought about because of our sin. And so don't avoid thinking about it, but look to him who is the answer of it. Look to him who is the giver of eternal life. And then as we continue here, Uh, we see another comparison and Solomon telling us what is better. We see verse 3 says, sorrow is better than laughter. Now, the word for sorrow is a word that's usually translated as anger. And according to Tremper Longman, many modern translations say sorrow because they're trying to harmonize what we read back in chapter 5, verse 17. There it says, Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. And so taking from that verse, it would seem that being angry is not a good thing. And in that verse, it's not. Uh, But thinking about what we went over when we talked about that passage, I don't think it's really hard to harmonize what the preacher is saying in these passages. There in chapter 5 and verse 17, it is simply expressing the misery of one's life who chases after with so much hard work to obtain wealth and material things, as if wealth and material things is the end all of life, as if that's where one would find their ultimate satisfaction. The person who lives life like that, who pursues wealth like that, is going to have a miserable life. Because pursuing wealth as the satisfaction of life is like chasing the wind. So that person's life will be full of vexation, sickness, and anger. But that's not to say that anger is absolutely always wrong. There is a time when it is right to be angry. Now, even if our anger is righteous, we can still sin in that anger, depending on how we respond in that anger. I mean, we see the Apostle Paul warn the Ephesians about that. But again, anger is not in of itself necessarily wrong. There are times it is right to be angry. As a matter of fact, this word that's in question here is used in other places of God's anger towards sin. And I really think that's what's going on here. Uh, This is talking about anger towards sin. Solomon here, as he he talks about this, he's talking about correction. He's talking about when someone has just anger towards one's sin, that that just anger is better than someone who laughs at one's sin. 
None of us like correction, right? Yet, at times, for all of us, it's necessary. Even a stern and angry correction can be right and just and necessary for us due to the how bad our sin is, the severity of our sin, or the ongoing nature of our sin. And I think this is just another example of how trouble or an unpleasant situation, how suffering can actually be better for someone. We should prefer to be confronted in our sin, be willing to have those uncomfortable conversations to deal with our sin, rather than have a flippant attitude towards our sin. Because sin is a serious matter. Sin is deadly. And unrepentant sin, if we continue in a lifestyle of unrepentant sin, it could show that we've never truly repented to begin with. We've never truly trusted in Christ to begin with. Godly wisdom, and so godly living, is found in those who are brought to contemplative mourning over their sin, rather than never knowing when to set aside their jocularity when to set aside their, their flippant and, and joking around about their, their sin. And we see verse 5 runs along a similar line. When it says, It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise rather than to hear the song of fools. Better to have someone call you to repentance than for someone to encourage you or condone your sin. And we see that those who, who condone sin and laugh about it, encourage it, are, are, are like pursuing a jolly good time with it. Uh, their laughter is like fire of thorns under a pot. It burns hot, it burns fast, and it's easily extinguished. And as it burns, it crackles, it's loud, like Laughter. But it doesn't last. And to seek after pleasure and fun, instead of having somber reflection on how one is living and the things they are doing, it's all just vanity. It's empty. It's a waste. It is better to have pain and suffering that forces us into thoughtful reflection rather than to pursue good times that help us avoid reflection on how we're living, and reflection on who we should be living for. And then as we continue here and get into the next section, we see that trouble and suffering, though it can have its proper effect in causing us to reflect on our lives, it could also have a negative effect. And so we see that in verses 7 and 10, that when one refuses to endure suffering patiently, they can wind up hurting themselves. For instance, we see in verse 7, when one is tempted, like someone who is in power can be tempted to unjustly oppress those who are under them, or when one who is tempted to take a bribe does take that bribe, it has a corrupting effect instead of enduring under the suffering of temptation. Oppression will drive even a wise man to madness. In other words, he's, he becomes crazy as he's drunk with power, doing things just to show he can, just because you need to listen to me, so go and do it. We see such power goes to one's head. I think we can see some examples of that, even of our own government uh, over the past while. That there, as there's been an opportunity to gain more power, as that opportunity comes, that temptation to grow in that craziness that Solomon talks about here uh, is seen. And when a bribe is accepted, it just causes one to grow in their corruption. So when we face temptation, instead of just jumping into what looks good, instead of just jumping into something that, that seems to have an immediate benefit to me or, or pleasure to me, Instead, I should contemplate what the outcome of that action would be. What, I should contemplate how my sin will turn out. 
Often we only think of the immediate benefits when we are under temptation. But we should think of the end. But who wants to do that? We want what we want, right? So we can live and act as if the beginning of a thing is better than its end. What immediate benefit is there for me? Sometimes we think so short-sightedly. But we need to think long and hard about the consequences of what we do. What will our sin result in? This requires patient reflection to understand what the preacher pleads with us to consider in verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Again, wisdom is found in thinking about not just what's at the front of a matter, but how it will turn out in the end. Those who were in the men's group uh, during the fall in those six weeks when we were watching the Tom Pennington videos, in those videos he was talking about, uh, the last video, he talked about lust and sexual temptation. And he talked about fighting against such temptations. And the one thing he says was to rehearse the tragic consequences of sexual lust. And he said, temptation always leads us to think about the pleasure of sin. Scripture, on the other hand, urges us to think about the tragic consequences of sin. And he was right. It is better to think on the end of a thing rather than its beginning. When temptation comes, we have to think, where will that sin lead? What is the consequences of that? We have to remember what Scripture tells us, that sin is enslaving. Choosing our sin instead of warring against our sin leads us to choosing more sin. And we can find ourselves enslaved in this. And and it is, again, a demanding slave master who will not just let us settle with that sin, but will invite more sin in. Jesus, instead, calls us to deal with our sin decisively and severely. What do we read in Matthew? Oh, I guess that I edited this. I changed things around throughout it, but I guess I didn't hit save. (laughs) It should be Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 to 30. There Jesus said, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Listen, if if we are in Christ, then we are a new creation. If we are no longer those who are under his condemnation, if we're no longer those who will face his coming wrath, then how can we continue to live like we are? Unless we are still under his condemnation. And notice here in Matthew, there is a warning about hell. Hell. For those who continue in their sin instead of dealing decisively with it. But see, those who come to Christ are made new in Christ, are indwelled by his Holy Spirit, and have died to the old self who is enslaved to sin. And so when we continue in sin, that actually robs us of our assurance. And why? Well, because continuing in sin may prove that we never truly trusted in Christ for our salvation to begin with, that we never trusted in Christ to deal with our sin to begin with. And so when temptation comes, don't just think of the beginning. Don't just think of the immediate benefits. But think about the outcome. Think about the consequences. Think about how it can hurt our relationships with one another. How it breaks our fellowship. Think about the the, the other damage it can do to your, your witness and your testimony to Christ in the world. Think about the eternal consequences of living in sin, of choosing your sin. Take time to think about the consequences instead of arrogantly running headlong into your sin for the immediate benefit. We should always be contemplating our actions, thinking through what we're doing 
as opposed to just reacting to our circumstances, reacting to what's going on around us. When we just react, we get ourselves in trouble. And I think we, we see an example of that. We could be tempted to just react to our circumstances when things don't go our way, when, when things are, are, are hard for us, to react with anger. If we're someone who has a short fuse, someone who tends to blow their top, well, Solomon has a word to say about that in verse 9. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. No, again, patient endurance and suffering is what is called for. According to this verse, if you have a short fuse... If you just react, if you, you blow up in anger, you are a fool. Also then, as we see going into verse 10, we also must be aware, that not only are we to endure under suffering, whether that's temptation, whether it's facing injustice, or whatever it is, maybe we're facing death and the loss of a loved one, as we endure under suffering, we must make sure we continue in the right perspective. We see there in verse 10, we can find ourselves losing perspective and so longing for days gone by, when life was simpler, uh, when it didn't hurt as much. You know, the good old days. Now, what makes the good old days the good old days? I like what uh, Warren Wearsby says about that. He said, the good old days are a combination of a bad memory and a good imagination. The truth of the matter is, whenever you are, or whenever you're thinking about, whether it's the 80s, whether it's the 90s, which I tend to think the 90s is the good old days, for, for myself at least, the early 2000s, getting into the teens, or maybe for some, the 70s and 60s and 50s and beyond. Whatever the good old days may be, whatever we're, we're reflecting on, all of those times had both good and bad. And whatever there was in those days, that was good. Pining for the past is not going to get us through today. We should be grateful for the things in past days that were good, that God had given. But we need to forge ahead. God has given us our lot for today, and we're not promised tomorrow. So we have to be ready. We have to grasp wisdom, fear the Lord, and turn to him for the forgiveness of our sins. Call upon the Lord while he may be found. Live today trusting in your sovereign God. Contemplate your ways Live in view of the day of your death and or in the day of the return of the Lord. And this will help you and cause you to live with wisdom. And what we see as we come to verses 11 and 12 is that wisdom is more valuable than riches. Having money and gaining an inheritance can be a good thing and it can give one an advantage. But without wisdom, that inheritance can be squandered away and foolishly lost. So wisdom is good with an inheritance. And really, wisdom is an advantage for all who see the sun, or in other words, all the living, no matter who we are, whether we have an inheritance, whether we have riches or not. Wisdom is good for us. And verse 12 explains why. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. When you have money... When you have a savings, that can help get you through a rough season. But money is only going to get you so far. If that rough season lasts too long, you can run out of money. Wisdom, though, wisdom too can get you through a rough season. But as opposed to running out, wisdom will help you to know how to keep your life and so persevere. And so somber times and hardship can help us to gain wisdom with that self 
contemplative reflection. And so, my friends, how should we respond in our circumstances? What do we do with trying times, suffering, or when we face the reality of death? Should we buck against hard times? Should we spend our days wishing we were in the good old days? That in some sense are only the good old days because it's not where we are anymore? What will that get us? We live in a fallen world. We live with sinners all around us. We, we ourselves sin. And so how should we not expect things to not always go our way? How should we live as if we're not going to have pain and suffering, as if we're not going to face death? There's so much in this life that is not guaranteed to us. But one thing that certainly is guaranteed to us is suffering, is loss. And so we shouldn't live as if that's not the case. And the fact that suffering is a guarantee for us is no accident. But as we see in Ecclesiastes, we only face the things we do because God, in his righteous and good purposes, has preordained for us to go through all the things that we do go through. And so really, there's nothing we can do about it. This is the plan. God is God. We are not. And so whatever he has determined for his purposes will be. And so we see in verses 13 and 14, God is sovereign over all of our circumstances, over everything we go through in our lives. And verse 13 says, Who can make straight what he has made crooked? God has ordained both prosperity and adversity. And he's not given us the knowledge of the things that will come. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow in our lives, let alone what's going to continue on in this world after our time in this world is up. So should we think we know how the world should go? Do we think we know how everything that happens in our lives and the lives around us is going to fit together in God's purposes and plans? No, we don't know the future. We don't know what's after us. We have to trust ourselves to our sovereign God. And in prosperous times, we should enjoy what we have in their proper place. And in adversity, in troubled times, we should allow it to cause us to reflect and consider our ways and understand our time in this world is short. Like Nate read in James earlier, what is your life but a mist here and gone? Our life is short in this world, and we should contemplate that. Let us take each opportunity to give thanks to God and praise Him for all He has done. And let us thank Him and take advantage of the circumstances that bring us to our knees and depend on Him in deep reflection of our lives, in deep reflection on the fact that we are here to live not for ourselves, but for Him. So let us learn to rely on him through all of our trials, all of our pain, and all of our suffering. Let us reflect soberly on our own lives, asking him to show us how we have failed to repent as we should, how we have failed to be more like Christ as we should, and ask him for strength to grow in Christ-likeness. As we praise him for bringing all that is necessary into our lives, all the struggle that he has deemed necessary to make us holy. So to use our lives for his honor and his glory. To use our lives that we would be more and more the person who is putting away the things of their earthly nature and instead living to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The things that God has determined to bring into our lives are things that he has determined are necessary for us to struggle through for his glory for his good and right purposes and making us more like Christ, right? That brings us back again to Romans 8, 28 and 29, right? 
that we know in all things God works for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to make us conformed into the likeness of his son so that he would be the firstborn or the preeminent one among many brothers. That is for our good to make us like Christ for his glory. Can we trust that? Can we trust God's sovereignty in our circumstances? Can we trust his good and right purposes in everything? And endure with patience, knowing he is doing his work in our lives. That is what it is to trust our Lord, to endure and see the good that he is bringing about as he brings us to dependency upon him and self-reflection of our lives. Knowing that one day, though we will die, we will be with him for all eternity not because of us, but because of him, because of his goodness, his work in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's worth it. He's worth suffering through whatever he has determined to bring into our lives. He's worth whatever it takes for us to become more like Christ and bring him glory. He is worth it. Can we trust that he's worth it? He is our great and awesome God. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.